Grace and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father, which is manifested, shown to us through Jesus his Son. Amen. The word for us to consider is the portion of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in which he talked about the different gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us. There he summarized that in verse 7, <coughs> saying, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. This is the word of God. In the name of our Savior, who gave all to us so that we can give to him. <coughs> when I was younger, I didn't have any way of earning money. But birthdays would come, and Christmas would come, and I wanted to be able to give something to my parents or to my brothers. And so when that happened, my parents developed the custom of giving us each some money so that we could buy those gifts. It wasn't a lot of money, it might have been $2 at the time when I was young, which would have bought a lot more than it does today. But I do remember one time when I went out and I found something really cheap for one of my brothers, bought that and then kept the rest of the money for myself. Didn't go over too well with mom and dad when they saw the present being opened. They asked me about it, tried to tell them that it cost $2, but uh, they were a little wiser than that. And I quickly learned the lesson that I have to be faithful to the responsibilities that I was given. I think that kind of mirrors what God has done for each of us, has it, doesn't it? God has given us all gifts, the most important being our faith, which is our ticket to heaven, but then also other gifts that we can use for the common good. And as we look at those gifts, we realize that we can use them in ways that aren't pleasing to God, and he wouldn't be happy about that. Or we can use them faithfully and responsibly in ways that would make him happy, that would bring glory to him, and benefit others that we live with. That was the message that Paul shared with the Corinthians in this part of our text. He had ministered to them earlier about law and gospel. They had, through the work of the Holy Spirit, come to faith. And they had learned that the way they were living was not always pleasing to what God wanted to see. And so Paul encouraged them to change their lifestyles. He had to go away from Corinth and later on heard some not so flattering things about the people and what they were doing. And he wrote this letter to them. He addressed some of the concerns he had. And then he used this part of his letter to remind them, these are gifts you have from God. Gifts that God gave to you, specifically to you, so that you can use them to his glory. Think about how you're using those gifts. Same message for us this morning, isn't it? We have been given faith in Jesus as our Savior. We have our tickets to heaven, and now, as we're on that journey... God has given us blessings to use, and they can either be used faithfully and responsibly, or we can use them to satisfy our own <coughs> sinful desires, or in ways that aren't necessarily in line with God's will. Obviously, we know what we want to do, and we know that the power to do so comes from God. So let's consider these words and the encouragement that Paul gave to the Corinthians under similar circumstances. Let's do so under the rallying cry, all for one. God gave all for each one of us. Let each one of us be determined to give our all for him. Paul began by reminding the Corinthian Christians that their lives before they had been brought to faith were, were not lives that were going to lead them to a good place. He said that they were serving mute idols, idols that were helpless, idols that could not do what they were professed to be able to do. And many times they were kind of tricked or misled into following these idols, being given empty promises about what would happen. And at other times even they were, they were forced into this type of worship. But then Paul reminds these Corinthians that you're different now. He said, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Then Paul reminds them that he was sent to them to set them straight about those idols and their worthlessness. He preached the gospel message, and through its power, the Holy Spirit led them to their true God and true Savior. 
And he said, that should make a difference in your life now. What you were told to do for your idols <coughs> was not what you were supposed to be doing for God. Corinth was a, a pretty rough neighborhood. It was on a trade route, so there were a lot of business people that went through there, a lot of people from different areas, and it became known as a very immoral community. In fact, to Corinthianize really meant to sodomize, to fornicate, to practice sexual immor immorality. And that had even bled into their worship. Temple prostitutes were common in Corinth. Now imagine this small group of Corinthian Christians being surrounded by that kind of an atmosphere, by those kind of peoples, by that powerful influence 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When Paul had to move on from Corinth and wasn't there to, to oversee them on a daily basis, he saw some of them slipping back into that. One of their own had even had an affair with his stepmother, and instead of reprimanding that person for doing that, the Corinthians had kind of celebrated it. It's what the community around them considered a conquest, a victory. So Paul addressed that, but he addressed a, a more general scope of topics too. And he said, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. No one who truly understands what Jesus has done for them, no one who has been led to faith by the Holy Spirit, would do or say things in their lives that, that would say, Jesus, be cursed. We don't care about him. We're going to serve ourselves. And that's what many of them were doing at the time. But they had a faith that had brought them to Jesus. A faith that could not have been brought to them except by the Holy Spirit. And along with that faith came a power to overcome the sinful temptations of the flesh. Along with that came the promise of God's presence throughout their lives, no matter where they were or no matter how long they lived. And if they would keep their devotion to God, he would keep his devotion to them. After all, remember what he did for them. He sent his one and only son to redeem them from their sins. It always amazes me when we think about what Jesus was asked to do. None of us can really comprehend the burden that was placed on his shoulder that kind of surfaced in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying and drops of blood were pouring from his forehead because he knew what was about to happen. And we say, well, yeah, Jesus knew he was going to save millions of people when he came and, and went through that. And so it was worth it and he, he, feel, he felt the power to do so. But I don't think Jesus looked at it like that. How many times in his preaching didn't Jesus talk about individuals and his love for each soul? And I think when he left his throne in heaven, he didn't just see a mass of people and think about how wonderful it would be when he saved all of them, but he saw faces. He saw individuals. And think about this. If you were the only one that he saw from his throne in heaven, he still would have come down and gone through all of that for one individual. And so Paul wanted the Corinthians to think about that. God gave all for each one of them. And God has given all for each one of us. We can say Jesus died for the world because that's what John the Baptist said. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But we can just as accurately and correctly say Jesus died for me. And if I were the only one that he could possibly save, he would have still gone to Calvary's cross to do that for me. And when I think about Jesus doing that for me, it certainly makes me want to do things for Jesus. And yet, so often we find ourselves slipping back. We realize that we, in and of ourselves, do not have the strength to serve Jesus responsibly and, respons and, and, and faithfully. We realize that when we were born, we were enemies of God. We were blind to his truth and love. We were dead in our sins, and there wasn't a single thing that we could do to change that. But God reached out to us, 
God sent his gospel message into our lives. God called us to faith through that gospel message. And God changed who we were and who we would have been. Jesus and Matthew said that out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. And we say, yeah, that's those bad people. I'm not like that. But if it wasn't for Jesus, we would be. If it wasn't for God's love and power affecting our lives and leading us to recognize what he did for us and giving us the power then to do for him, we would have been worshiping mute idols, worthless idols, many of whose practices were detestable to our way of thinking. People in Canaan were sacrificing their children to their idols to try to appease them and buy a little more time, and they considered that normal. And that's where we would have been without God coming into our lives. But the manifestation of the Spirit has been revealed to each one of us. First of all, bringing us to faith so that we can say Jesus is Lord. Giving us the desire and the strength not to say Jesus be cursed. And giving us the wisdom to understand the difference. As we live our lives and we are faced with decisions and choices and, and things that we need to do in our lives, we, we know from the gospel what is pleasing to God. We know from his law what's right and what's wrong. We know what is displeasing to him. And then, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do those things that are pleasing to him. And as we live our lives, we have to ask, is, is what I'm doing saying Jesus be cursed or is it saying... Jesus is Lord. And when we realize who that Jesus is and what he did for us, then each one of us for whom he came, died, and rose again will want to do all for him. Paul explained to the Corinthian Christians, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men. It's reported that Mozart wrote his first piece of piano music when he was four years old. I'm not sure I could even recite the alphabet when I was four years old, let alone write a piece of piano music. At five, he composed his first symphony. At six, he was playing in major concert halls. Picasso, as a young teenager, already had works of art that were being shown in museums. Obviously, these people had special gifts. The Lord isn't going to come to us one day and say, unless you can sit down and play a symphony piece on the piano or paint a piece of art that would hang in a museum, you're no good to me. You know, this isn't the only section of the Bible where God talks about the gifts that are given. There are other sections where he lists some different gifts. But also in Jesus' ministry, he said that if you just give a drink of water to a child who's thirsty, you have done an amazing thing in my eyes. He praised the woman who brought two small coins to the church treasury because she was doing it out of love for her Lord, giving all that she could for him. Nowhere in any of the sections where he talks about gifts being given to people and how they should use them, does he set up ranks or does he tell us we're in a competition? He knows if he's given us one quarter or two quarters or three quarters. He knows what abilities he's given us, what talents he's blessed us with, and all he says is use them faithfully. And as we do that, he says, we will collectively use them for the common good of all. Tree of Life is nearing its 20th anniversary as a congregation. And during those 20 years, there have been a number of different members who have come and worshipped and praise God together with us, and moved on to other places. New people have come. Some of you have been here from the beginning. But through all those 20 years, God has always blessed us with enough <coughs> gifts and talents to be able to worship him, to be able to share that message with others, to be able to enjoy fellowship, activities, and social outings together, to encourage one another, to be a blessing for one another, to use all of our gifts for the common good. And it's easy for all of us to think, well, I don't have anything that I can do, but then you're calling God a liar. 
He said, to each one the manifestation has been given. The Spirit gives different gifts to different people. He gives different amounts of gifts to different people. But you've all got at least one thing you can do. And God wants us to consider the abilities that we have and to use those abilities. And if you just think about what it takes to put together a worship service on a Sunday morning, you'll start to see how the different pieces need to fit together. There are folks in other states worshiping with us today because somebody knows how to put together computer live streaming. Somebody's there to work the computer monitors. We have a pianist to play the music for us. We have a secretary to work up our bulletins. We've got ushers. We've got all kinds of people working together so that we can spend this one hour learning from Jesus and serving Jesus. And as we do that, reaching out to others and preparing you to share your faith as well. How sad it was in Corinth when Paul got the news that the church wasn't doing that. That they had slid back into some idol worship. They had, they had kind of loosened the reins on people and they weren't demanding everything that God demanded of them. He had to write them a letter and straighten them out. And at times, because of our sinful nature, we need those reminders too. That perhaps what we're doing is saying, Jesus be cursed instead of Jesus is Lord. And how thankful we should be that God sends people like Paul to the Corinthians and people into our lives, too, to remind us of our need to reconsider the gifts we have and the talents we have and the blessings we've been given, to think about how we are using those for our Lord. Remember what he did for you. He doesn't ask you to do as much. He knows you never could. But he does say be faithful, be responsible. Use those blessings in a way that will honor God and benefit others. And as we do that, we will find that serving becomes a joy. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he showed us how far he was willing to go by saying, and to give my life as a ransom for many. So too, we have those opportunities to serve. It's not always about what can I get out of it. But what can I put into it? It's not always about what should they do for me, but what can I do for them? And the more willing we are to take that servant's role and to help others, we'll be blessed by God. And we'll see just what he can do as he puts those parts all together and turns us into the body of Christ. The Corinthians listened to Paul. They reevaluated their lives. They reprimanded the immoral brother who had had an affair with his stepmother. They tightened the reins, referring to God's word as the source of right and wrong again. And they were blessed for it. The Lord does the same for us too. When we listen to him, when we follow him, when we let him be our guide in life, he will bless us as he has in the past. The Lord has promised to never leave or forsake us, that he'll be there to the ends of the earth. Let's be careful that we don't walk away from him. Let's be careful that we don't focus our attention on ourselves first and him second. Let's be careful that we use his words and his sacraments faithfully and regularly so that the Holy Spirit can continue to nurture us and strengthen us and keep us on the straight and narrow. And when we fail, don't make excuses. Don't blame others. Don't try to justify what you've done. Simply admit it. Take it to the Lord as we did this morning and say, I'm, I'm sorry I'm heaping this on your shoulders, but you've invited me to do so and you've promised me I will be forgiven. And we will. And then renewed by the forgiveness that comes from the grace of God, we will want to say thank you and show our gratitude by what we say and do for the Lord. You know, my mom and dad were right in calling me to task for what I did. It wasn't a pleasant experience knowing that I was caught. I'm sure I tried to make some excuse or another. But in the end, I learned a lesson. And I think it's been part of my maturing and moving forward in life. And so it is that God, too, asks us to consider where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed in life. And are we living to the glory of God and the benefit of others? Pray that the Holy Spirit will fill your hearts through the message of the gospel and through the sacrament 
that you will have that desire to serve your God who gave all for you. And as we do that together, all for one, we will be able to do amazing things for the Lord. God bless us as we serve him. One individually, all of us together, using the opportunities we have to the best of our ability to the glory of God and the common good of all. Amen. And may the peace of God that goes beyond understanding guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offerings to the Lord will now be gathered. <laughs>